and I'm going to introduce Roy as when I was here at uh, the other Roy, <laughs> by the way, uh, talking with uh, Roy and uh, here and doing a walkthrough about having a foreign agent party here. He was sitting at the next table over just listening and just enjoying themselves. He was just like shooting a little zinger question here and there, and I'm like, and I just, I figured him out. And I'm like, what's, what's your story? And he said, I'm a sex therapist. I'm like, hey, can we have you there that weekend? Because is, is having uh, someone uh, 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 on our, we here for the weekend just adds an element to what we do here at Fornication Weekend, which is, is mind, body, spirit. You know, fucking sex, spirituality, uh, shame, uh, talking about shame, talking about coming out. It's, it's, it's the whole gamut. So he just like immediately was a big fat yes. That's what I like to say. It's like, I like to be a big fat yes to life. And uh, he immediately said, yes, I would love to. And um, I'm happy to have him here to uh, talk what he's about to talk about. And it's it's the perfect continuation of what you started, which is about shame and being free of shame. So welcome, Roy. Frankie fixed me this drink, so I wish I had saved it so after, <laughs> after we talk. When you grow up in the Southern Baptist world, to announce that you're gay means that you enjoy butt sex with men. And there's what people think about when you say I'm gay. That's all they think about. So, um, January the 21st of 2019, when I decided to get on Facebook, after a prolonged announcement that I had a special message for all my followers, and from the Marietta Square Live, I announced that I'm gay. I've been gay since I was 10. I'm going to marry Michael, and y'all need to get over it. <laughs> now, I was supposed to talk to you about how to be free from shame. Uh, I'm not sure that's the way to start. <laughs> but what it did do is juxtaposed me um, from the horse's mouth. No rumors, no gossip. This is who I am. Um, if you didn't know this about me already, it's because you weren't important enough in my life to have known that part of me. And many that I worked with did know. Um, but from that point forward, I was called Satan, the leader of the apostate world, the one who's going to be responsible for the majority of people who's going to hell when they die. Um, my, mine and Michael's favorite one, this is my husband Michael, wait for him. Uh, our favorite one is uh, I'm the fox in the hen house. To which my response is, well, that's odd because uh, I don't like hens. <laughs> but I remember going through that and being enraged of how dare you? Who are you? Who do you think you are to not only come against me in such a personal way, but to literally think you have the right to deprive me of life? To deprive me of the right to love and enjoy living and the right to be a person in my life. Who are you? And my friend Kathy Baldock in Nevada said, Roy, don't engage it. Roy, let it go. Roy, don't waste your time on it. They don't want to know the truth. Roy, don't. Well, I did. <laughs> and every time we found ourselves in this emblazoned argument where I was started and <laughs> Michael would try to finish it. And it would just be ugly. Can I say that? It would be ugly. <laughs> and from there, I grew to the place where here is my response. You can call me a name today. You can think I do butt sex with me. And you can think any ungodly, slutly thing you want to think about me. But here's what I'm going to think while you're doing it. You don't matter. You don't matter. Now... I was supposed to talk to you about being free from shame. It started back in 1957 when I was born into an environment. Father was a World War II vet. Father was a trauma victim where his mother got murdered when he was six and he witnessed it. My life was hell. And so right from the beginning, I learned as a child, you can't be heard. You have to be invisible. Well, from there, it was very simple, a lifelong process of not mattering. You're insignificant. You don't count. Be quiet. 
don't be seen. Children are seen, are seen, not heard. Yeah, you've heard that. Yeah, all that stuff. Well, then, later, I found myself in Southern Baptist ministry. Why? Because I grew up out of that culture. And you can't not be a part of it because that's what the whole, you know, they believe. Yes, sir. Uh, they speak for God. They bring God's word and thoughts to you. And if you don't conform to that thinking, then you're going to go to hell and you die. And that's just the end of it. Well, that's not true. But from my upbringing, I, I learned in life that you have to conform Otherwise, Leroy will spank you, and that's a kind word. Or, in later life, you have to conform or you'll get dismissed from the church, which at the time equated to me dismissed by God. And all of that ended up in trying to change me, trying to figure out a way to change others. And in the end, we all are, you know what? If, if you're born gay, you're going to be gay when you die. Now, I'm 64 years old today, and I can tell you with great certainty, no matter how hard did I try to change everything, nothing changed. And it's not going to. You know what's better? It doesn't have to. So that day when I stood up in the Marriott Square and said, this is who I am. With great integrity, I've lived my life. Uh, if you've got any criticism against me, I want to hear it. It may be acknowledged. It may maybe not. Maybe right. Maybe not. I don't have to get mad. But here's what I do have to do. I have to accept me. I am Roy. I am a gay man. I am married to Michael. I live in the Eagle Watch subdivision amongst a bunch of heterosexual evangelical people. I kiss Michael in the driveway out in the front yard. I hold his hand when we go to Walmart. I'm going to be me. And if you don't like that, whoever you is, that's not my problem. That's your problem. I believe that much of our culture has come to the place of being able to be astonished when they see us holding hands because they've never seen it before. That's important because we are so, it risks a lot to be seen in public. In other words, in some settings, if you come out in the wrong kind of way, you can get, if your landlord doesn't like it, you can get evicted. If your employer doesn't like it, you can get fired. If your lender doesn't like it, you can lose your mortgage. And so it can be very costly to come out. But when you are able to come out and be yourself, that is the way. So I say take calculated risk to come out and be yourself. That is the way to find freedom from shame. Now, I'm fortunate. I was older when I did this. My house is paid for. My car is paid for. I work for myself. And... Uh, and my granddad used to say, you see these four corners? Talking, <laughs> talking about his property. I'll never forget the power company came up one day. They had this big bulldozer and this uh, power pole. They were going to replace a power pole on this property. He said, hey, come here. Mm -hmm. See these four corners? You come inside these four corners, we're going to do it my way. Now, you go outside these four corners, you can do whatever you want to. I've adopted that principle into my life today. I want to be happy. I want to help people. I spend my whole life helping people, but I refuse today to be a part of being shamed by somebody who doesn't know me, doesn't understand me, and doesn't want to try because of whatever reason, whatever reason, it's not my problem, it's theirs. And I think that is the way to find freedom from shame. It is not an event, by the way. I'm very encouraged by your story. You can identify with me. It's a process, not an event. And as you go through that process, you gain courage. As you go through that process, you gain strength. As you go through that process, you gain wisdom. It's the same for everybody, that process, but it's different for everybody. And being yourself, appropriately calculated risk in disclosing yourself, learning to let it be someone else's problem, not yours and standing up for you and demanding respect from those around you. That's how I say we find freedom from shame and be happy to entertain these questions. Thank you. So what came up for me in those quick uh, questions is, 
I love how both of you just really like, it's not my problem. Um, the question that I have is, many times, how do we how do we not come across as a fuck you? Because usually people will come across with a fuck you when they're trying to just be express themselves or be out or be uh, sh uh, free of shame, but it comes across as a fuck you. And sometimes they'll say fuck you. <laughs> well, unfortunately, in any behavior we learn, we start out executing that behavior at a place of immaturity. Um, you have to learn how to restrain the emotion from the response. That's not easily done when you're ready to um, take somebody's head off because they've insulted you and you're trying to respond to them. You're going to do it in a way that says fuck you. Uh, so the process for me was to end the saying of fuck you, which I did, Southern Baptist minister and all. Uh, I could say that I evolved in the place of what am I doing? I'm responding to them in a way that's not much different than what they're responding to me. Yes. Is that the person yes. I want to be or am? Preach. No. <laughs> so I began to back away from it and it's then I realized why am I, why am I upset? The only way this person has power over the way I live my life is if I give it to them. Yes. And if I choose not to give it to them, then I reserve that power for myself and my life, and I put them on the other side of those four corners of my yard. And that's the way I learned. I, I, I still have to work at it. Um, I still have to remember what I used to, and I still teach clients. When you hear something, there's a 24-hour rule. You don't respond for 24 hours. You don't respond for 20, no, you don't respond for 24 hours. <laughs> because if you do, 90% of the time you'll regret it. But if you wait for 24 hours and you think about it and realize, you know, who the fuck are they? And the answer, nobody. Why am I going to invest my time and energy in even responding to them? I'm going to reserve that time and energy for me and how to be a better person for me. And if they want to come alongside of me and ask me kindly, with respect, who are you? Why are you thinking this way? Why are you doing this way? I will exhaust myself in helping them come to terms. If they come to my door with a Bible in their hand, though, trying to persuade me or convince me that I'm wrong, they don't get the time of day. They don't get my emotion. They don't get my response. They get a close door. Thank you. Um, and I, um, I am going to tag on that. Just you know, you, good, uh, ten years ago, I believe I was um, slandered. In other words, uh, I don't get a lot of that on social media. I'm down on Twitter, and I took seven days and formulated about thirty-five responses, and didn't send it, and didn't send it, and didn't send it because. I was trying to convince, show them something, and justify something I didn't need to justify. You're trying to persuade them to see you in the light that you are, and they don't want to. Yeah. First, I've tried to persuade them in the light that to see me, and and they don't want to. And and so at that at the end of that, I couldn't I couldn't respond not in the same manner as them is the bottom line. And so I walked away, and silence was my answer. So, so in doing that, I think that that very arduous and difficult process very. that we're speaking about is where I sort of gradually developed self-acceptance in a way I thought I knew before, but today I can say more concretely that I know. I like me. I'm okay with me. I can walk out here without my clothes on. I can walk out here with my jock strap on. I'm not the prettiest thing to look at, but I'm okay with me. If you're not, look at someone else. Okay? Now, I don't, I'm not disturbed. If you think I'm ugly, that's all right. There's plenty of other people you can look at. If you don't like what I say, that's fine. You don't have to listen to me. You can listen to someone else. So, but I like me. Now, I care about you until the point when you disrespect me or try to impose your views on me, 
that's where the wall goes up, and that's where you will not get Roy's response, but you probably will still get Leroy's response. And it's not usually pretty. But you get the message. Uh, now the questions, come on. I know you got questions for him. <laughs> yes? So, this environment uh, is often seen as like an oasis of freedom, right? So, you talked about coming out at an older age. I know in my experience in coming to these environments, you have older gentlemen who are necessarily, I don't want to say they're living a double life, but they use this to actually be their true self, right? So what are you saying to those young that come to this environment to just kind of authenticate themselves and be their true selves? So the question is, at a, a oasis like uh, the hideaway here, uh, many people live lives here differently than the rest of their life, and what do you say to those that come here for that and express themselves here? Yeah, that's a question. Yeah. I would say I want to respect that some of us have to live a dual life, if I could say it that way. Some of us, all of us can't be open and out like I am. Um, it takes emotional energy, it takes time, it takes courage, it takes support. Um, and you have to be able and willing to risk what it may cost you. Because it is very costly. It cost me everything in terms of relationships. Um, I had 12,000 people view my uh, Facebook Live announcement in the side of uh, two weeks. And everybody that I used to know as my friend became my enemy. Now, not everyone's able to face that, nor should they try. So I, I, I love Roy's Hideaway. Other places like the River's Edge, which is where I first went. And I remember the day um, Michael and I went there, I said, I want to go there because I want to get rid of my inhibitions. Now I went there and actually went to a place in Alabama first in the uh, Bluff Creek Falls. Um, but I, I walked around naked, I smoked pot for the first time, that was a bizarre story. Uh, Michael had to carry me home. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when I left there, I decided that not only was I in a position to be me at home as well, you have to wear clothes at home, or uh, at least out in the yard, but Others maybe can't do that, and that's okay. And in those cases, I am grateful for places like this where you can come and be amongst community and find relationships and meet people that are like-minded. And, and from there, I say, look in that um, Garden of Eden, we'll call it, like here, look for ways that you can be your authentic self at home. And if you're able to find support and guidance and help, then maybe you can also have your own journey of being more open and self-accepting outside of here as well. Did that answer your question? Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Yes. Bye. Roy, how old were you when you came to that self-realization that you were going to uh, present yourself in front of the way you're talking about? So the question is, how old were you when you came to your to the realization present yourself authentically. It's a, it was multiple times. I remember being 40 when I sat at the senior staff table of a 35,000 member megachurch in Woodstock, Georgia. I was a part of the executive team and I announced that not only am I attracted to men, but I have been since I was young. Now I was married to Nancy at the time and what could they say about that, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm not fornicating. I'm not committing adultery. The Minister of Education would say, well, that's a sin. Well, how can it be a sin? Well, the Bible says, I don't care what the Bible says. Um, that was a beginning for me. This is who I am. Now, the part that you heard me talk about here was um, 18 years later. I was 58. Um, and at that time, when I had... Um, it's a long story, 50, 58. I'll be glad to share more about that with people. I can talk to you. I can preach and ramble for hours and days. Well, the one thing I would tag on that, the one, one thing uh, I think uh, with all of us, uh, well, with the three guys that I talked about, 
is I uh, interact with a lot of men across the United States and uh, the, it's a very thin veneer of acceptance we have as uh, men, uh, as, as same-sex, um, I, I, I like the word queer, that's my favorite new word. Um, uh, in other words, we have to stay on our toes uh, and the coming out process of different levels is not necessarily much easier than it was, I'm going to say different than it was, but it's still not easy. And right under that thin veneer of acceptance, there's the, and actually there's kind of a come back to the question, which is, it's okay, I've actually finally had my family basically say, it's okay if you're gay, just don't have sex. That's kind of like the new, I'm not homophobic if I say that. That was what we came to in the church over my career. If I did any good in that tenure, uh, part of it was my own self-discovery and realizing that God was okay with me even if I wasn't. That the orientation I have is something I have that he either made it or allowed it to happen and it's not going to change. Um, but besides that, I never, I can't sit here and say that I was able to influence the uh, Protestant church into accepting gayness. But what we did accomplish was to say it's okay to be gay as long as you don't have sex. And at the time, we would call that unwanted same-sex attraction. So the ministry would be uh, to go to conversion therapy and get rid of the unwanted same-sex attraction. And you would learn how to deploy uh, spiritual principles to do that. Only problem is, and I was a, I'm, I'm a, I was a member of the board of directors at Exodus International at the time, when uh, I began to realize, you know, we're working real hard to help people change, and nobody's changing, even <laughs> us. That it says. John Hulk was the, uh, the the poster boy, if you will, on the cover of Time Magazine about ex-gays. And then uh, Wayne Beeson, one of our advocates at the time, still is, um, found him in a gay bar and took pictures of him. And he, and he supposedly went in there because he had to use the restroom. Of course. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so, cruising the road. <laughs> so it became sort of obvious to me in those days that, you know, we, we have a whole national and international organization of ex-gays who are still gay, trying to help people become ex-gay and they're still gay, and and if you follow that whole industry now, you know that that is Alan Chambers uh, led us to the place of shutting it down, and there's still attempts to revert it in various forms. But I've not forgot the question. I hope I answered it. <laughs> yeah, but it's about the thin veneer of acceptance, and that there's still a, there's a big force of unacceptance. That it, it, there is a big force of unacceptance. It's because. And I, I don't know how, how quite to say this, but I think the, the requirement that we live underground until today. Young people today don't know what pride stood for. Young people today can be gay without the extreme costliness of maybe back in that day. So we don't, but up until today, the, it's been underground. And no, when it's underground, nobody sees it except us. And society's not been conditioned to understand it or required to accept it or f faced with trying to understand it. It's still, I, I can tell you, Michael and I can go into the, to the mall and I'm going to hold his hand and everybody we walk by is going to, first thing they're going to see is us holding hands. And it makes me want to take a stick and whack them. Like, what's wrong with you? Have you never seen anybody hold hands before? And the answer is no, we've never seen two men holding hands before. And I'm thinking, why the hell not? Because we can't do it because we get rejected by society and culture. And when we get rejected by society and culture, we're ashamed we feel rejected. We turn it in almost as if there's something that we've done wrong. That's the way we're made to feel. And so I keep continuing to hope that we can reverse that going forward. And we can just say, as we're able to say, hey, this is who I am. I'm Roy. Yes, I'm a gay man. I'm 64 years old. I'm married to Michael. I'm happier than I've ever been in my life. 
uh, get over it. And that that is when I think the thin veneer will disappear, and we can just be who we are amongst people, and it won't be it, it won't be responded to as if it's odd and out of order. One last question, anybody? All right. Thank you, Roy. Anybody have a question about anything that you missed on any all any four of us that you want to revisit? One last question, question, question. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all for coming out and uh, engaging. The questions were awesome. Uh, and thank you to each of the speakers. I personally uh, am moved and uh, I'm on board. Like, you know, you know, the authenticity is what this is all about. It's really about authenticity and freedom. The journey. The journey, the journey. And giving ourselves the opportunity for the journey. Yes. And, and as we allow ourselves the journey, to the same degree we allow others their journey. And so that's what I heard you know, all of us talking about. Uh, and I really want to thank you for coming out and uh, um, really, really letting us know uh, a deeper level of who, who you are. Um, so after this, um, I don't know what time it is. I think. Uh, I, oh, there we go. There we go. Um, in about 15 minutes, this room will be transferred into a. a, a we'll have go go, dance, uh, go go dancers here, and it'll be a nightclub and slings in the corner. And uh, you'll have yet another buffet supplied by yours truly, fornication. Uh, and um, have a great time. Thank you all.